started here in the Trust in 2013 and took over from uh, someone who many of you may know, uh, Graham Keyes, who was the uh, knee surgeon here from Macclesfield. Um, I thought I'd just spend a moment just giving you a little bit of background about myself. I trained uh, in London after going to university in London. I spent all my time there. You mean yes, that? I'm a Westminster nurse. Oh, are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fantastic place. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm very happy for people to interrupt, by the way. If you, <laughs> if you want to hackle, please feel free. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I um, trained in London, and um, whilst I was there, I was very fortunate to work with some um, world renowned um, knee surgeons, uh, in particular Andy Williams and Jonathan Lavelle at Chelsea Westminster. Who I did a sports um, knee fellowship with. They're the go to guys who all the Premiership football clubs, and um, they're re really respected guys. And very lucky again to be selected to go to Canada to the University of Western Ontario, where I spent a year doing complicated knee replacement surgery and redo knee replacement. So, a redo is when you have a knee replacement that, say, has worked for 15 or 20 years, but it's, like, it's come to the end of its lifespan, it's worn out, it's painful again. So, I take them out. <coughs> I put in a new knee replacement which is a little bit more complex than doing it the first time around. And as I said, I'm based here doing knee surgery, so it's just a list of some of the things that I'm currently involved in, and um, which is why I really wanted to talk about advances in knee replacement surgery in particular. It's something that um, I'm very interested in. A couple of things I'll point out. One is the, uh, the Navia, which is a robotic assisted knee replacement. That's really new technology. Um, and um, I'm the second <coughs> knee surgeon in the northwest of England to actually do this operation, so it's very new. And you're helping your attention to the conformist, which is a truly bespoke total knee replacement. And I'll explain that to you as we go along. So this is, these are just examples of some of the things that um, I do. So some of you may even have one of these. This is an Oxford, a partial knee replacement. So if you have arthritis affecting only one half of the knee, why remove the whole knee joint? You can replace only part of the knee joint. So this is a, a partial knee replacement here. So this is a knee, by the way, in case you're not familiar with the anatomy. This is the thigh bone, this is the leg bone. And on the right here, we have a total knee replacement where we have replaced the bottom end of the whole thigh bone and the top end of the leg bone. As I said, I do the redo ones as well. So if you look at this knee replacement here, I'm sure many of you can appreciate that something's not quite right there. Um, what's happened here is that the implant is actually broken. It's snapped, and the underlying bone here has disappeared. So it's like subsidence on, your, on a conservatory, for example. You know, as the soil and the ground gets soft, it starts to sink. The wall starts to sink, and you start to see cracks appear in your wall. So this happens when a knee replacement comes to the end of its lifespan. So this is a revision. The, this same knee that I've revised, and you can see that it's nice and straight again. But you can also see that the bits that are in this knee are now much more complicated. Okay, so there's more involved in redoing a knee replacement, which is why we always advise people not to have knee replacements early in life because they will wear down and then you will need more complicated surgery to redo it later on in life. I also do hip replacements through a minimally invasive technique, I, um, through a small cut which encourages a quick recovery and less pain after surgery. Now getting on really to the meat of the talk. So what I want to do today is just give you guys a little bit of information about the knee joint itself. The knee is a very complicated joint. It's the biggest joint in the body. Some of you may be familiar with the anatomy, but I'll just break it down simply for you. We have three main, well, two main bits of the knee joint. We have the, the end of the, well, the thigh bone called the femur, and we have the leg bone called the tibia. Now, these two bits come together and form the main knuckle of the knee joint, the bit that sort of moves does most of the movement. We also have the round bone at the front of the knee called the patella or kneecap. And that glides along the end of the thigh bone when your knee bends. It glides in this groove here. Now the knee has several important structures within it. Firstly, you have cartilage. Now cartilage is a really incredible thing. Um, it lines all of your joints. It's extremely smooth. And it allows the joints to glide against each other. So there's a minimal friction. It's like two ice cubes gliding. When that cushioning or the cartilage wears thin, you get down to the bone and people say, oh, I've got bone on bone arthritis. What they mean now is that that shiny smooth surface has disappeared and now you have two bits of sandpaper rubbing against each other, which causes pain, stiffness, swelling, and a creaking sensation in the joint when you move your joint. 
We have other important structures, like the cruciate ligaments, which sit in the middle of the knee joint, and you may be familiar with footballers who have ruptured their anterior cruciate ligaments. And we have two ligaments on the outside of the knee. So the cruciate ligaments stop the leg bone sliding forward on the thigh bone, whereas the ligaments on the outside of the knee, this one here called the medial collateral ligament, and the lateral collateral ligament, stop your leg wobbling from side to side. Okay. Two more structures before we move on, and they're called the menisci, or the shock absorbers. So these are commonly injured or torn, and are a common reason why we perform keyhole surgery to the knee, to go in and tidy up tears to these structures here. Their main function and purpose is to act as a shock absorber, protecting the joint surface, preventing you from developing arthritis. So if in your 20s or 30s, or your teens, you've had your meniscus removed, 20 or 30 years later, you will almost certainly have arthritis in your knee, okay? And, you know, in the 70s, even in the early 80s, people thought the meniscus was like your appendix. You didn't need it. It was just one of those things that was in your knee. So people were whipping them out left, right, center. And now we have an epidemic of arthritis as a result of this. So this is just a schematic diagram showing a healthy knee joint. But when the knee or the cartilage starts to wear down, it blisters revealing the underlying bone. And that's what we refer to as osteoarthritis, or wear and tear arthritis. <laughs> Don't worry, it happens to me all the time. Um, so this is another diagram showing you know, a, a diseased joint on the left-hand side. You can see the cartilage is worn away, it's eroded, it looks really messy in there. And we can treat this with an operation called the total knee replacement, which essentially <coughs> resurfaces the joint, both the end of the thigh bone and the top of the shin bone. And importantly, there's a bit of plastic that sits between, um, so that the metal on the thigh bone glides on the smooth plastic, rather than the two muscle bits coming together and clunking. So, what are the symptoms of, of arthritis? Well, some of you may have arthritis in a joint, and you'll all know that your joint becomes painful, it becomes stiff, it swells. There may be deformity, you may see particularly arthritis in your fingers, it's quite obvious there's bony lumps around it, the ends of your finger, for example. And you lose function, most importantly, so arthritis in the knee, for example, you may struggle to walk at distances, you may find it difficult to go up and down stairs, for example. You may have pain when you're trying to sleep, so it gets in the way of your quality of life. So how do we treat arthritis? Simply, we start without surgery, obviously, with painkillers, physiotherapy, walking aids like a walking stick to take stress off your knee joint, and then knee injections like steroid injections. And if all of those things fail, then surgery is an option. So I don't want to spend too much time going through the history of knee replacements because that's a, a separate topic in its own right. However, this is the first documented knee replacement. Um, it's, it was uh, invented by a surgeon called Gluck from Austria in 1891. And essentially, he thought, well, why don't I devise a simple hinge? So there were two bits to it that locked together. And this is the knee side on, the thigh here and the leg here. And he essentially took off the end of the thigh bone and, and the top of the leg bone and fix these bits into the bone using plaster of Paris. Now, clearly, it was never going to be successful, and this is before the time of antibiotics, and infection most probably was the first thing that caused this thing to fail, but it was still, you know, the first documented knee replacement. As we got into the 40s, there were lots of designs, hinges in particular, so these are very crude knee replacements where you have long spikes that go into the bone, and essentially the knee will only move like a hinge, okay? Very crude. <coughs> and they were essentially metal rubbing on metal too. But they weren't metal on plastic either, so um, not very good. None of these things work very well. However, I'll now get into modern day era knee replacement surgery. So the aim of knee replacement is to take your pain away. It's to restore what we call the mechanical alignment of the limb. And I will explain this to you in a moment so it makes more sense, because this is crucial to some of the discussions we'll have further on during this talk. And obviously, we want to restore your function. We want you to have a better quality of life so you can get back to doing all of those things that you, you wish to, whether it's playing golf or just being able to walk, or walk short distance of, distances without the discomfort. So if we look at the bits and pieces that go together to comprise a total knee replacement, essentially, there are either three or four bits. 
Every knee replacement will have three bits. Some knee replacements will have the extra bit, and I'll point these out to you. So this is the femur, and this is the bit that goes on the end of the femur. This is called a prosthesis or a component. So we interchange those words. Some people will say femoral component, others will call it a femoral prosthesis. They are the same thing. We have a bit that goes on the top of the leg bone called a tibial prosthesis. And the third bit everybody gets is one of these things, which is called a polyethylene insert. It's a highly cross-linked polyethylene, which is very hard-wearing and very durable. So these bits all go together to form the total knee replacement. Some people have severe arthritis in their kneecap joint, or their kneecap, when it moves, doesn't move in a straight line on the knee. So the kneecap is like a train that runs on the tracks, and the tracks are the end of your fiber. In some people, their train is not running on the track, it's going off to the side, and we call that mal-tracking kneecap. So we have the opportunity to correct that at the time of your knee replacement by putting, by shaving the undersurface of the kneecap away and putting a plastic button there instead. So the, this button then glides on the groove in the middle of the femoral component. Okay? I just want to turn your, your attention to one other aspect of this diagram before we move on, and that is you can see that the end of the thigh bone, the femur, has been cut in what we call chamfers. These chamfers help us to fit the femoral prosthesis snugly onto the end of the thigh bone, so it fits like a glove. So we have to very carefully saw the bone to create that shape. This particular cut here, the one right at the end of the thigh bones, so if you were standing straight, it's the one that goes straight across the bottom end of your thigh bone. That is the most important cut, as is the cut at the top of your leg bone or the tibia. And that's because when those two bits come together, they affect how your limb is aligned. Does everyone, um, does that make sense? Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. So moving on to how we do a knee replacement. I can't go through the ins and outs. Again, maybe another talk, another time, because there's a lot involved. However, if we break it down into a few crude steps, we open up the knee joint. So this is um, a knee here, the foot is down here. The hip is here, and the knee is bent. This is the end of the femur, the thigh bone. This is the top end of the leg bone, the tibia. Essentially, we insert rods. So this is, don't worry, this did not come off a volunteer. This is <laughs> some sort of styrofoam or plastic. So this is the thigh bone. This is the hip joint here. Obviously, this is obviously the foot. So what we're doing here is we're making a hole in the right place in the middle of the knee, and we're putting a rod down it. Now, off that rod, we are able to slide down these special things called jigs, J-I-G-S, or cutting blocks. They enable us to, we can, we can dial in how many millimeters of bone we want to cut off the end of the thigh bone, and we can choose the angle at which we want to cut at. All of those things affect the alignment of the, of the limb after the surgery. So, we put rods down the bones. We then put the jigs on and we saw the ends of the bones. And finally, we fix the prostheses that are a pair of shoes, and they only have a nine or a 10. You may choose the 10 because the nine will be a bit tight. But ideally, you would have liked to have had a nine and a half. But that's the compromise we're making at the moment with a lot of knee replacements. We don't have every size to fit every individual. And that's something I will discuss further on in the talk. That's something that we can address these days. So, Moving on, this is alignment. So if we look at the image on the right-hand side, we can see that clearly this patient has bow leg alignment with their knees. They're walking like John Wayne. Okay. So when we drop a line from the middle of the hip to the middle of the ankle, that line falls on the inner side of the knee joint. If you are not kneed, or what we call valgus, it's the opposite. If we drop a line from the middle of the hip straight down to the ankle, the line falls on the outer side of the knee here. When we're doing a knee replacement, it's important that we correct these malalignments or misalignments to create a straight leg, a limb, a, a neutral mechanical axis where when we drop that line, it goes right to the middle of the hip, the middle of the knee, and the middle of the ankle. That's what we're trying to reproduce when we do a knee replacement. And why is that important, you may ask? Well, the reason for that is, these red arrows are where the force is distributed through the knee joint. And when we have a neutral 
straight alignment, we can see that there's an arrow on both sides of the joint. So that force is distributed equally on both sides of the knee. If we have John Wayne alignment, the force is going to the inner side of the knee. And if you're not knee, it's going to the outside of the knee. And that affects whether you have arthritis on the inside or the outside of your knee. But in relation to knee replacement surgery, the reason it's so important is if you look at this x-ray on the left hand side of the screen, if we drop that line from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle, clearly it's going on the inner side of the knee joint. But once we've done the knee replacement, we've corrected that, and that line's going right through the middle. And why is that important? That's important because when this patient walks on that knee replacement, we're loading the knee equally on both sides. If we load the knee too much on one side or the other, the plastic bit in the middle will wear down quicker on one side than it would do on the other. And when plastic wears, it does bad things to the bone. It causes the bone to dissolve, it disappears, and then the foundations become very weak, and then the knee replacement starts to move, and it gets loose, and then we have the situation where um, we get into this situation here, where the bone dissolves away because the plastic's gone really, really thin, and the knee doesn't function any longer. So what we're trying to do is preserve, or sort of make that knee replacement last for as long as it possibly can. To my mind, 15 years is okay with a knee replacement. I think it's okay, I don't think it's great. I think the knee replacement should last 20, 25, 30 years. Why shouldn't they? You know, and that's where we're trying to move towards now with newer designs, newer technology. But um, it's important to get the alignment absolutely right. And it's important. Does everyone understand the concept of alignment now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Yeah. So what are the challenges with knee replacement surgeries, the knee replacement operations these days? Well, if you look at all the results of knee replacements performed all around the world, and you take them all together, you will find that one in five people, or 20% of people, after a knee replacement will have pain in their knee, and they're just not happy with their knee replacement. That means 80% are really happy. Of the 20% that are unhappy, some of them have a little niggle, others will have a severe pain in their knee. And Everyone probably knows someone who's had a knee replacement that has some discomfort in their knee. But why does it happen? Well, because the alignment may not be right. We may not be getting that right. That could be surgeon error. So how can we correct that? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. Some of it could be the design of the prosthesis. Like I said, if you're a nine and a half, but you're wearing a 10, it doesn't quite feel right. Or if you're wearing a nine, it's too tight. It definitely doesn't feel comfortable. So. Perhaps we need to make knee replacements that are individualized for each person so that they feel more normal. So we really want to improve patient satisfaction. We want to make sure the knee replacements last longer. And they function well. So what can we do to do this, to improve these things? So one technique is called patient-specific instrumentation. And I apologize, it's a long word. Not well, three words, it's quite a mouthful. But essentially, what it refers to is, are these things here. Okay. Now, I've brought a couple with me that have been used to do one of these operations, and they've been cleaned and sterilized, and I'm happy to pass them around if you guys want to have a look at them. Um, they're not sharp, and, and they are clean. So, essentially, the way this process works is you come in, you see your consultant, you have an x-ray, the x-ray confirms arthritis, you decide to proceed to a new replacement. However, if your consultant has a particular interest in this type of surgery, he may offer this to you. Now, what is the advantage of this? Well, the advantage is that these things are made specifically to the shape of your knee. So they will fit only onto the end of your knee. And that is done by performing a CT scan, which images the top of your hip, it images your knee, it images your ankle, and then the CT scan creates a 3D image of your limb alignment with the arthritis. Just say your knee's arthritic and your knee's deformed like that. The software can be used to determine what the alignment should have been before your knee became arthritic by measuring how much cartilage is worn away, for example. The clever guys in the States then 3D print these things to fit perfectly over over the end of your thigh bone. So this will only fit on a specific femur. And it will fit like a glove. You'll move it around until it just clicks in place and it won't move any further. There are holes in the ends of it 
But those holes are for pins, so we use pins to drill into the bone to hold this in place. And then the metal bit here, the silver bit, is a slot, and that slot is the perfect diameter to allow a saw blade to go into it. So we can then accurately cut the end of the thigh bone, exactly where that cut needed to be for your knee to create the optimal alignment. A similar one is manufactured for your leg bone, and that sits on the top of your leg bone, just like this. Again, it will fit only in one place. You have to find the right spot. You then pin it with some pins, and there is a slot here for the saw blade to go into, which will take off the top of the leg bone at exactly the right depth and the right angle, so that when the two bits come together, you get the perfect alignment. Okay. Now, if we take that technology, well, okay, what are the downsides of this? Well, the downsides are there's increased cost because you have to pay for a CT scan, which you don't do <coughs> with conventional knee replacements. Plus, the CT scan goes to America. It takes six weeks or so for them to process it and then send the bits back, sterile, packed, so that I open them at the time of surgery. And the other downside is, despite doing all this, which is fantastic, it will get, get us good alignment, but at the end of the day, we're still taking an off-the-shelf knee replacement and putting it onto the, into the knee, which is still good. It works really well. However, it's not really bespoke. So if we then move on to another technique, which is the Navier, which is a robotic assisted knee replacement. And to be very clear, I'm not sitting in the coffee room having a, a coffee and a biscuit while the robot's doing your knee replacement. <laughs> the robot is in theater right next to me, and I'm interacting with it. <coughs> with the screen here, okay, so this is the robot. There is a monitor, which is a touch screen, which gives you all the information. And there is an infrared sensor here at the top. The infrared sensor sends infrared beams out to this piece that I hold in my hand. This is the hand piece. The hand piece has these discs on, on, on it, and these discs reflect the infrared beams back to the robot. So the robot picks up an idea of where, it, where that hand piece is in space in relation to that patient. We also put a disc, one of these discs, in the thigh bone here, and one in the leg bone. So that when we move the, the leg around, the robot knows exactly where that leg is moving. It knows where the center of your hip is. And I put the probe here on the ankle joint. It knows where the ankle is. And it makes, it takes all of that information and it builds up a picture real time during the operation. So we don't need a, a CT scan. So you want to have your, one of these? I think you come in next week. And we do it all in theater, real time. At the end of this handpiece is a burr. This burr can spin 85,000 revolutions per minute, so it goes quite fast. But it can also go from zero to 85,000. So it, it only activates when it's in the right place, when it's supposed to work and take bone away. And that will become clear in a moment. So there are three main stages to this. I know this may seem very complicated, but I'll try and explain it <coughs> as simply as I can. These are pictures from the screen that you see during the operation. So the first stage is called registration. And what we're doing here is we're registering the anatomy of that patient's knee joint. So that hand piece that's in my hand is used to paint over the end of the thigh bone, over the knee, so over all the joint surfaces and on specific landmarks on the knee joint. And with that information, the robot builds up a picture of that knee joint. And we do the same thing on the tibial side, on the leg bone side. And the image at the top shows L and M means lateral and medial. What that refers to and what these lines here are the tension in the ligaments around the knee. So as you get the knee out straight and you bend it and you put stress on the ligaments, the robot's able to work out how much stress and how much laxity there, are, there is in those ligaments so that when we're doing the knee replacement and putting the knee replacement in, we can get the balance just right. The aim of this is to give you a knee replacement that feels as close to a normal knee as you can get. So once we've registered all of the points, we then go to the planning stage. This is all done during the operation. So what we're looking at here is the silver bit is the prosthesis, the actual bits that go in the knee. So now we're able to superimpose those on that patient's knee to place the components where we think they need to go. And whilst we're doing that, these orange and purple dots give us information on how the ligaments will be tensioned depending on where the prosthesis is positioned. So if I want to 
pretend to move that prosthesis out a little bit, I will see what it does to the ligaments. If I want to reset it back a little bit, the tension in the ligaments will change. So you're getting all of this information before you've made any cuts on that bone. So you're getting all the feedback, all that information, which can guide you to making the cuts on that knee in exactly the right place to potentially give that patient the most normal feeling and balanced intention knee replacement. So finally, we go to the bone preparation stage. So this is where it gets interesting. So the, computer, the robot has now stored all the information that we've entered. It knows what I want to do. It knows my plan. Now it's going to help me execute the plan. And so with that handpiece and the burr, okay, I need to drill or burr out some holes. One, two, three, four. This is the end of the thigh bone. So we're looking at the end of the thigh bone here, okay? And the reason we need to make those little sockets is so that we can fit this thing, which is a jig, just like we saw in the previous slides, into those holes, which will be positioned perfectly to make the cuts in exactly the right place. Okay. So what I will do now is run a video, which I have had in the presentation, but it wasn't playing, behaving itself. So I'm just going to run a video, just so um, hopefully it will make a little bit of sense. So it's an animated video. There's nothing gory here. But this is a patient. We're in theatre. Um, so you're registering your points, building up an, a, an idea of the anatomy of that particular knee joint. Again, we're planning, working out where we need to cut and what the cuts will look like before we've even done them. We can test the ligaments to see how they feel before we've made any cuts. And this is where we're positioning the prosthesis, where we think it needs to go and how that will, in, in the optimum position to get the best alignment. Now this is the burr. So the burr will help me drill those little lug holes, which are these red slots here, in exactly the right place so the jig fits in perfectly. And another bit goes on the bottom of the thigh bone, and they clamp together. Now, you can see that red line there. That's where I'm going to place my saw. And it will cut exactly where I need to cut. And this is just checking before you cut. You can put your, pro, your hand piece in the slot, and it will tell you, yes, when you put your saw in there, you're going to cut exactly this amount of bone at this angle, which is going to give you a knee replacement that moves and feels like you've planned. And this is, these are the other cuts that we have to make, all those red lines, and that's the prosthesis sitting on the end of the thigh bone at the end of the operation. The same thing for the leg bone. This is the leg bone. We've carefully burred our holes, we've put the cutting block on, and we've sawed the top of the leg bone, and we've put our leg bone prosthesis in. Okay. And you can see how it all lines up beautifully well. This particular um, technology is made by Smith & Nephew. So going back to the presentation, the next stage from there is to take it one step further. So we've talked about getting the perfect alignment and a really nice balanced knee that feels comfortable and moves well through uh, what we call extension where your knee is straight and flexion where your knee is bent. But again, we're taking an off-the-shelf prosthesis. Okay? So it, don't get me wrong, that works well, and we know from years of studying these things that 80% you know, of people are very happy with an off-the-shelf prosthesis. However, what if we were able to design a prosthesis that was specific to your knee? That would mean that you were not compromising on the size of your prosthesis. It would fit just like a glove. <coughs> and more, more importantly, when we put it in, everything around the knee, the ligaments, etc., will be balanced perfectly for your knee again. So this technology and this is made by a company called Conformis. And um, again, the downside is that you need a CT scan. So again, we lose six weeks in doing a CT scan, sending it to America. They process it in a very clever way. And I'll show you a video which will make it, make it all sort of fall into place. They then manufacture the prosthesis specifically for you with a 3D printer. So essentially, they send a, little, a nice little square box. When you open it, it has prosthesis in it. It has the plastic inserts in it, and it has all of those jigs. There's five of these things that go onto the thigh bone and the leg bone, so we can cut everything in exactly the right place. So let's have a look, little look at a video which will hopefully demonstrate this to us. 
So the first thing that we do is we work out the alignment with the CT scan. So this is a knee with arthritis in it. Okay, so you can see the worn out knee joint. So we do a CT scan of the hip, of the knee, and of the ankle. And then we work out what the alignment is for that patient. And then we work out where we need to move it to get the alignment just right. So the CT scan is then processed with special software to build a 3D model of the knee. And the end of the thigh bone is round. So these lines here, the red one refers to the curvature of one side of the knee, the other side of the knee, and the bit where the kneecap moves. So we produce these curves called J curves, which match the shape of the prosthesis perfectly to the shape of that patient's knee. So this looks very different to a standard knee replacement um, sorry, I don't have a picture of a standard one to compare. Well, you will see a standard one in a moment, actually. And you can compare the two. They look very different. This actually looks like a normal knee now. However, if there's a knee replacement on the end of it. If we now look at the leg bone side, you can see how we produce the prosthesis for the leg bone. We, it, it outlines the shape of the top of the tibia. And you can see the prosthesis is perfectly shaped to that patient's tibia. And there are two plastic bits as opposed to one. And the reason for that, if you look at the plastic bits, you'll notice that one of them is higher than the other. And that's what the normal knee looks like. One is higher than the other. Because when you straighten your knees, you may not be aware, but your leg turns inwards right at the end. And when you bend it, it turns, your foot turns away from you. So by having those plastic inserts at different heights, it recreates that what we call the home, screw home mechanism. If you look at this prosthesis, it fits perfectly. There's no overhanging of the bone. And if we compare it to a standard knee replacement, which you'll see in a moment, this is just demonstrating the heights of the plastic. And with an off-the-shelf knee replacement, you'll see that the plastic is one height, which is the red line. And perhaps that affects how the knee moves, making the knee perhaps not move as well as it could do. <coughs> The other issue here is we talked about compromising with sizes. The one on the right hand side, you can see there's red bone exposed around the knee replacement. So it doesn't quite fit that knee, but it was the best compromise. And there are bits overhanging on the, on the thigh bone. And you can see the prosthesis not sitting flush with the bone at the back. And this happens with knee replacements because we can't possibly get an off the shelf prosthesis to match every shape of bone. But with the one on the left, you see it's perfectly shaped. There's no overhang. So in summary, that's a, a bespoke knee replacement that's designed for the individual and is put in exactly the right alignment for that particular patient. So um, that really um, brings me to the end of the presentation. I hope um, uh, it was of use and it wasn't too, I hope mean, you all understood it. If there are any questions, I'm very happy to take questions. Great. Do we have any questions? Yes. Oh, well, yes. 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 Okay, it's it, it is currently being used in the UK. Uh, sorry, actually processing the images here. Well, the companies are based in the US, that's the problem. So I suspect as um, the uptake of this technology becomes greater and you know larger volumes of this surgery are performed, perhaps they may start processing these in the UK or in Europe. But currently, the company is based in the United States. So it, I think for quality control purposes too, all their engineers are based in one place. It's just easier for them to I mean, when you do this kind of surgery, you really have a close relationship with the company because you're corresponding with them at every stage of the manufacturing process. They keep you up to date. So, um, and they also keep the patient up to date. The patient also receives emails to say, you know, your prosthesis is now at the stage of manufacturing, or we've received your CT scan, for example, or we're about to ship your prosthesis, for example. So it's a very bespoke um, Bespoke sounds expensive to me. Mm, yeah, true. Anything bespoke is expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, just to give you a rough idea. Yeah. Um, if you were paying for your own knee replacement, but you wanted one of these, you probably would pay two and a half to three thousand pounds more than a conventional knee replacement. Now, mm -hmm. actually, I thought it would have been a lot more than that yeah. because you know you're having a CT scan, it's going off to another country. They're making something for you. It's a one-off mold, you know, then it goes in the bin. So, you know, there's a lot of expense, time, and, you know, 
uh, involved in actually manufacturing it. So, you know, 3,000 pounds, yeah, I mean, for some people it's worth it. They feel that yeah. they want to try and optimize their knee replacement as best they can. But, um, is that not available on the NHS? It isn't at the moment. No. <clears throat> it's a material they use. Well, they use the same material for conventional knee replacement. So most, the metal bits in your knee replacement are made of a metal alloy, cobalt, chromium, and molybdenum. Um, and the plastic bit is, like I said, highly crossed in polyethylene. So uh, they use a similar uh, material because it's tried, tested, it's durable. Yeah. Is there a place for ceramics to come with this? There is, and ceramic is actually something which is currently being discussed. We use ceramics quite a lot in the hip, so yeah, the hip it's very good. Yeah, in the hip it's good, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there are some downsides to ceramic, as you know, if you drop your ceramic plate on the floor, it turns to sand. Yeah. So um, that, that can happen in your hip. You know, if you have a, you know, a, a trauma to your hip, it can just fracture and disintegrate. Yeah, it turns into dust, and you, can't, you just can't get rid of it. Once you go in there, it sticks everywhere. It's horrible. It's hard to tell. Exactly, so titanium. What is your thought? Were you a met metal metallurgist or orthopedic surgeon, no, maybe? No, I was a, I had, I did a lot of experimental surgery. Okay, great. Um, and I have a lovely knee replacement for 15 yes. years. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. There's nothing wrong with conventional knee replacement. So no, that's don't. the point I was trying to make. All of these technologies are trying to perhaps um, get rid of some of those outliers. So, you know, maybe narrow down that 20% of people who are unhappy to maybe a smaller percentage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think um, this is probably where things are going to go in the future. But ceramics in the knee, yes, it's been discussed. Um, the issues are trying to manufacture a prosthesis that will withstand uh, the stresses that um, are, are required to go through a knee replacement. Um, titanium is very good, it's bio-inert, it's compatible with the body, however it's very soft, very so soft. it will break down and um, people have tried using titanium tibial trays in knees, which cause all sorts of problems, metal, debris in the knee, it's, it's, it's not very pleasant, so uh, good around the hip, not good around the knee. Is there any chance I could top up the cost of the NHS needs so if you did my own? Good question. I uh, have no idea. Maybe in the future that might be something uh, that may be possible, but not at the moment, as far as I'm aware. Do you have to remove the knee? No, no, so you, the kneecap's essential. If you don't have a kneecap, the knee doesn't function well. It acts as a fulcrum, okay? It uh, transmits a lot of force through the knee joint, so it gives you power in your knee. So we must preserve the kneecap. Uh, like I said, sometimes we, if the kneecap's badly diseased, we shave a very precise amount of bone off the bottom of the kneecap, taking the bad cartilage away. And then we put a plastic button on there, which is cemented on. Uh, we put, there's a few drill holes, and there's a few little pegs on the bottom of the plastic which go into the holes, and the whole thing is uh, fixed with yeah, cement. So you have to move the kneecap to one oh, side. To get, to get into the, the knee and get access to the knee, there's two things you can do. When you move out the joint, you can either slide it to the side, or you can evert the kneecap. So just turn it upside down and get it out of the way. And that's what was demonstrated in that picture there. Because the people I know have had knee replacement, they can't, well, no one person can kneel down, but most of the people. Yeah, regardless. The, look the kneecap does look different. <coughs> Generally speaking, we advise people not to kneel on their knee replacements because um, if you have your own cartilage there, you're pushing up against metal, which can irritate the cartilage. If you have a plastic button there, because you've shaved some of the kneecap away, the kneecap is very, very dense bone, very dense. However, if it gets too thin, it could crack. And if you have a fracture or a crack in your kneecap, it could compromise the function of your knee. So. We recommend people don't kneel on their kneecaps for long periods of time. If you have to get down and do something quickly, just put a cushion down, spend as little time as you need to. But um, the general advice, is regardless of whether you've had surgery to the undersurface of the kneecap, is really best to avoid it if possible. Yes? Um, yeah, I've got sorry. two. Sorry. I've got two um, other things. Um, and I remember Mr. P saying at the time, you know, you, if they go wrong, then you might. I'm, I'm one of the 80%, by the way. Okay. Um, and can Oxford knees be replaced as Oxford knees, or does it become totally yes. replaced? You can replace an Oxford to another uni compartmental or Oxford, for example. Right. However, the results of that aren't as predictable as revising it to a full knee replacement. Right. And it really depends on why your Oxford failed in the first yeah. place. You know, has it just worn out? Has the plastic worn out? If the plastic's worn and actually the Oxford bit, the metal bits are well fixed, you can go in, just 
quick MOT, take the worn out plastic out, put a new one. Yeah. So it's called, it's called a liner exchange. 15, 16 years old liner. It's a liner exchange, yeah. I mean, Oxford's a great operation. It's one I, I do Oxford myself and some of my happiest patients, so patients have had Oxford's because the knee moves like a norm, almost like a normal knee, really, after an Oxford, compared to a knee replacement where it feels very mechanical. And an Oxford is when it's just one. An Oxford is when you're replacing half the knee joint, not the full knee joint. It's that x ray I showed you at the very beginning where only half the knee joint is <coughs> Yes, sir. Uh, on your original list, as you were going through what you were going to talk about, yes. there was some synovial regeneration on that. Ah, on the original list? Yes. Yes. Well, um, I felt I needed to sort of cut this it down. Out. Yeah, I missed it out. If that, to be honest, that's the whole hour uh, oh, is he? Okay. Uh, presentation. <laughs> uh, got time. I'm in a rush. <laughs> But uh, no, on a serious note, um, to understand that we have to talk about the science of cartilage, the science of, of cartilage healing, um, you know, how we've evolved over time from basic, you know, sort of just scratching the bone to being very precise with collagen scaffolds and things. And I think, you know, stem cells, etc. It gets very confusing unless you've got, you know, a good hour or so to, no, no, to really okay. discuss it. Sorry, apologies, maybe another time. <laughs> I'm happy to come back and give a talk on that. Yes. When you operate on someone who's got knock knees or what I would call bandage, you, you straighten one leg, what happens to the other leg? I'll, I'll that's, that's a very good question. Very, very good question. Yeah. So, so generally speaking, uh, if you've got one knock knee and you straighten it, that's great. But if you've got two really bad knock knees and you straighten one, then it's very difficult to actually rehabilitate after having one done. So there are two options. One is you do them both at the same time. You can do two knees at the same time, bilateral. You know, you, you can't do that in everyone. You have to be very specific and selective in who you choose for it, because it does put an excess, extra stress on the system, uh, on your on your physiology, physiology. Sorry. So your risk of a heart attack, for example, after having both your knee replaced at the same time, goes up a little bit. But if you're healthy, then it's a safe option for you. Um, to answer your question, generally speaking, most people will have a staged replacement. So we'll try and do both of them within a short period of time. So for example, you recover, after six weeks to three months, we get you in and we do the other one. So by three months, you have them both done, and then you're rehabilitating both knees at the same time. When you're going on from that, when you do that operation, do you not get problems with the hip and the ankle? When you do which operation? The, the straight in the leg. Yes, you do. Yes, I mean, you can imagine everything's used to being in that position for so yeah. long. All the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments around the hip, the ankle. Absolutely, everything. Take your spine as well. The amount of stress on your back, you know, when you're walking with a limp, is, is tremendous. So when you straighten the limb, it takes time for your body to adapt and adjust, and that can take six months to a year for things just to realign, and stretch out, and strengthen. But you know, that's where you know we can do what we think is a fantastic operation, but. We then need you know you and the physiotherapist. It's a team effort. It's not just the surgeon involved here. You know we have a big team: physiotherapist, occupational therapist, you as a patient, your surgeon. You know all working together to try and get you back to where you need to be. So you know that's where the physios really come in and you know, getting you to learn how to walk again, you know, strengthening the muscles around your head. I know it sounds silly, but you know when you've had a knee for many years, you actually forget how to walk, and you have to learn how to walk again. It takes time to get used to it. Given that um, most people are probably misaligned to some degree, yes, yes. and um, so I'm quite badly not need. I okay. need two new knees. My son was the other, and he's had two high to be a lost year. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so I, because I've got children, my thinking is that if all children uh, went to, is it biomechanic kind of, yes. and were assessed and, and had that misalignment corrected mm -hmm. as children, would that help for the future? I know there are lots of causes of yeah. needing new knees, but right. the misalignment problem is, yeah. is a factor. Is a factor. And, and, and if everybody yeah. was, you know, um, everyone was made straight. Yes. Yes. And you the left, yeah, yeah, and yeah, the bodies so. got used to, yes. would that make a difference? I think it would, but it's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, your alignment is genetic, so you have a malalignment, probably your son does as well. So there are lots of factors that influence your alignment. You can't correct everyone's alignment by putting through a biomechanical assessment, giving them orthotics. You can improve things, you can try and optimize the alignment. So for example, if you're 
Lots of things affect your alignment, like your feet, for example. But, you know, the limb is a chain. You know, the foot's connected to the ankle, connected to the knee, connected to the hip, connected to your spine. So there are lots of links in that chain. If you have a problem at any one of those links, it causes a problem above and below the link, too. So we always start by addressing the feet. Okay, so if you are not knee, for example, you tend to be flat-footed. They go hand in hand. So you can correct the flat foot in this by having orthotics or insoles in your shoe. And yes, that will improve the alignment of your knee, but it won't take you from there to straight. There's only a certain amount of influence it can <coughs> you know, uh, achieve in terms of affecting alignment. But you, know, you have to do everything you can. Insoles, work on strengthening muscle, release tight bits, and um, strengthen up the, the weaker bits. So you can pull everything into the alignment. But sometimes you need extra help, like an osteotomy, because the deformity is so severe that you know the insoles, the physio, just isn't enough. But I agree with you. If you could, if you could do that, then that'd be brilliant. But uh, I think it'd be very difficult to get everyone straight from an early age because uh, sometimes it's not possible. Yeah. What uh, happens to the cruciate ligament during the very replacement? Technical question. Very good. So, <laughs> generally, generally speaking. Um, I would suggest, I would say that every knee replacement, well, 99.9% .9 of knee replacements that are performed, the anterior cruciate ligament is taken out. Okay, we call that a cruciate, bizarrely, it's called a cruciate sparing operation, cruciate retention, because you have one at the back too, the posterior cruciate ligament. That one is left in most of the time. However, in order to correct severe deformities, most people would agree that if you have a severely bent knee, in order to straighten that knee, you have to sacrifice or cut out the anterior cruciate ligament. In some conditions, because osteoarthritis is not the only reason why people need a knee replacement. Some people have rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammatory arthritis. The inflammation destroys your ligaments too. So your posterior cruciate ligament, the one at the back, also becomes damaged. So in those cases, we have to take both the ligaments out but we use a special prosthesis, one that accommodates for the fact that we've taken the ligaments out. It's called a posterior, it's called a cruciate sacrificing prosthesis. Essentially, there's a box in the metal ferrule component, and the plastic bit has a peg, and the peg sits in the box, and it gives you more stability. So we use that type of prosthesis for severe deformity correction, revision redo scenarios where the ligaments may have been damaged or stretched because the knees just you know, knee replacements fail badly, and we need to correct the deformity. Um, so we're getting into the technical aspects of knee replacement surgery, but generally speaking, we sacrifice always to take out the anterior cruciate ligament. However, the reason I said 99.9%, .9 and I didn't put it in my presentation because I didn't think we'd have time, but some of the newer models or designs of knee replacements are cruciate sparing knee replacements where you keep both of the cruciate ligaments, but the prosthesis looks very different to a conventional knee replacement. You actually have to cut around the cruciate ligaments, leaving them behind, so your tibial component, the bit that goes on the, on the leg bone, rather than it being a large bit of metal that's quite flat, it essentially has a cutout in it where it, you can go around the ligaments and preserve them. That's very new. I don't, that technology's only been around for maybe a year or so, maybe a year, 18 months. I personally don't know anyone who's using it in this area. I know if you, they're experimenting with it in Oxford at the moment, they're doing a trial. So we have to wait and see how the results fare. If it turns out that actually, because preserving the cruciate ligament sounds like a fantastic idea. If you keep the ligaments, the knee will move like a normal knee. As soon as you take the ligaments away, actually the whole thing starts to feel very different. And the ligaments also contain nerves, which tell your brain where your foot is. So it helps with balance, and it helps with, with something called pro proprioception, which means positional sense. You know exactly where you are. As soon as you take the ligaments out, it doesn't. You don't quite know where. You, you know where things are, but it's not as sharp and refined as it was before. So if you can spare the ligaments, always better. Let's see how the results fare. If, if the results look good, then perhaps we may move towards that type of prosthesis. So the ligaments remain attached. You don't you're not cutting either. They're attached. The ones on the side, we always try and leave. Always, always leave. The ones right in the middle. So uh, the ligaments we're referring to are these, these ones here. So 
the ones in the middle of the knee. So this is the anterior cruciate ligament. It runs from the front to the back of the knee. And then we have this one at the back called the posterior cruciate ligament that yeah. comes from the back of the knee and comes into the knee joint. So this one here is always cut out. The one at the back is mostly left in. So these ones here on the side are always left in. You don't take those away. However, when you're doing redo, redo, redo knee replacements, because every time you do a redo, you're going back in, there's less bone than there was there before because the bone just dissolves away over time, so it becomes more and more complicated. Sometimes when you're doing redos, the ligaments are, f are no longer there, so you have to use a hinge knee replacement, which <coughs> does the job of your ligaments, so to speak. Right, so it's not a disaster these days to, to lose that ACL. Oh, the ACL, like I said, 100% of the time comes out, unless you're trialing one of these new prostheses yeah. where you're preserving it. In the partial knee replacement, the Oxford, for example, we leave it in. And that's one of the beauties of the Oxford, or a partial knee replacement. The ligaments are intact, so the knee moves and feels like a normal knee. As soon as you take the cruciates away, it doesn't feel the same. But the function is still very good. Yes? Uh, have budgetary constraints changed the criteria for eligibility for knee replacements? I think that's a very political question. I shall pass that on. Pass that on to our head of But yeah, I mean, to answer your question plain and simply, yes, absolutely. I mean, you only have to go across the country from one region to another, one county to another, to realize that, you know, if your BMI is over 30, you may not be eligible for surgery. However, in some places, if your BMI is under 40, you'll be eligible for a new replacement. There's, I don't think there's consensus across every part of the country, but yes, it's being used to withhold treatment from patients who desperately need it. And um, I personally don't agree with some of the constraints, particularly from a holistic point of view when it comes to offering surgery. I don't think your BMI, your body mass index, should be necessarily preventing you from having surgery. In all cases, in some cases, yes, because it can be unsafe and the risks are higher if you're you know, mm. your body mass index is very high. The risk of surgery and complications is higher. But some people, because of other factors, the, the way the BMI is calculated, it puts them out of contention when, in fact, actually, they wouldn't be unsafe for surgery. So it's, it's an arbitrary line in the sand, and it's a very political uh, point. And um, in an ideal world, it shouldn't be an issue. But, you know, in the NHS, unfortunately, the way pe people are budgeting and, and making decisions on where money should be spent, that is something they latch onto because they can straight away you can be excluded. You can exclude a lot of people from being eligible for certain treatments. Okay, thank you. One more question. Yes. Yeah. The um, robotic assisted um, surgery does that shorten the time of the, of the process or no? It does it? No. As you can see. Yeah. I mean, you've got uh, to do all those measurements. Of course. Yeah. So you know, a knee replacement can take you know. 50 to 60 minutes, really, um, from, from the moment you make the cut to actually closing the wound and having the dressings on. When you're using this technology, particularly in the early stages, there's a learning curve, obviously. Yes. It takes time. You know, everyone around you has to learn and adapt and know what to do. So I would say, rather than taking an hour, it may take an hour and 45 minutes. But actually, if you look at how long it takes people to do knee replacements, some people take 50 minutes, some people take two hours routinely to do a standard knee replacement. So I think it depends on the individual surgeon. Um, yes, it takes longer initially. Say, for example, if you normally take an hour, it might take you an hour and a half, an hour and 40. But as you do more and more and more of them, that time comes down. So it may only end up adding 20 minutes to your operation time, which really is not a big deal. <clears throat> and how much experience is there of, of using robots in this type of surgery? In this type of surgery? Yeah. Um, like I said, um, there's been three in the Northwest. I've done one of them. Yeah. So. Um, not much in this area, really, but actually it's an extension of what we do normally. So um, you are using new techniques, but you're not learning how to do a knee replacement from scratch. You know, you're, <laughs> actually, you're refining what you're doing. So yeah. you're, using, you're using additional tools to make your operation more reproducible and more predictable. Um, but Jeremy, to answer your question, no, it's not widely used in the UK at the moment. <clears throat> uh, the first few cases were performed in London in Stanmore, uh, and uh, and you know they probably have done more than most people. And then the, the technology is spreading. So it's moved from London to Manchester, actually. It's come straight from London to Manchester. So it hasn't gone anywhere else in the country yet. So 
it, it's new, but there are other systems, robotic systems available too. This isn't the only one. There are others on the market. Yeah. Um, this is the only one I personally have experience with. Is there likely to be more instances of infection when you're using robotics? Or I don't think so. No. No, there shouldn't be because no. everything is sterilized. Mm -hmm. and, um, the instruments you're using are sterile. The computer screen has sterile covers over it, so you can touch it and not worry about its infection. But yes, you make a very good point, though. If you're spending too much time doing a robotic knee replacement because you want to do one, but it's taking you three hours, the longer that wound is open, the higher the risk of infection. So um, the answer is no. However, if you are taking too long to do it, then or too long to do any operation, your risk of infection goes up, whether you're using a robot or not. But uh, um, there isn't an association between high infection rates and using this technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.